Well, hello again. Uh, so, new panel here. Um, uh, different angle on things, and so this is going to kind of bring uh, the financial resources uh, piece, the panel that we did earlier. It's going to kind of bring it home in a different way. Um, I'll start by introducing the panel. Um, so I'll start Paul Major on the very end. Uh, he is a manager at Rural Homes and a board member uh, at Paradox Community Land Trust. Uh, next to him, we have Adam Roy, and he is principal at uh, Headwaters Housing Partners, um, which is an affordable housing developer. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Mike Serac, and he is owner VP of development at Real America. Okay, so um, just to briefly introduce the, the topic matter here. So uh, Alex Yako last night mentioned, and she's with Habitat, uh, she described all of these financial resources as a cornucopia. So um, it is plentiful, there is a lot. Uh, the question is, is how to kind of harness it and bring it all together. Um, the panelists here have all done um, uh, multiple projects that have, in their own ways, um, they've they've kind of harnessed these resources in unique combinations, and um, and in that way they've brought uh, you know housing um, you know to the market. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, the financial resources in the context of their projects. We're going to talk about um, how philanthropic uh, capital and state and federal funding can all work together and we're really gonna hear about their playbooks, how they've done this. So, um, Paul, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you very much. I've got some slides. I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly. I've gotta lean over so I can see them, see what I'm showing you. So I'm Paul Major. I uh, am the manager of Rural Homes, and it's actually the Paradox Community Trust. We're not a land trust. So, while well, they get the slides up. so. I often want to start talking about this in the terms of, you know, affordable housing is a giant hairball. We all have come at it from a different perspective. Um, I think there's three different markets we're talking about. One is an urban market, which LIHTC development is really the driver in producing affordable housing units. The other is the Telluride, Aspen weirdness that, you know, as somebody said, the AMI um, they, they, they have no correlation to what's actually going in those valleys. But there's a third market, which is rural Colorado. It's Battlement, it's Norwood, Colorado, it's La Junta, it's all those other places. And there's 160 rural school districts. So there's a big part of Colorado that's not really in this conversation, but they're actually facing the same problem. And the problem is, is that the housing stock in those communities is old, dilapidated. So the number one problem for a school superintendent to recruit and retain teachers is housing. It doesn't matter if it's La Junta or Alamosa or Norwood or go down the list because the housing stock is old, dilapidated. No one's gonna start a 30-year career in a double wide. They're gonna wanna come to a town and they're gonna wanna start a 30-year career and they want house, and they want ownership, and they want to be part of the community and pay taxes. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. So we illuminate it um, with this slide about a teacher's salary. The average teacher salary in Colorado is $47,000. They essentially can afford a $250,000 home. In Norwood or Ridgeway or whatever, all of, everything that's on the market or being built is in that 600 to a million plus range. So can we solve the problem of actually building a $250,000 home and selling that to a local teacher, firefighter, uh, deputy sheriff, planner, whoever it may be? Uh, next slide. So our model is, I may have to get up, our model is community driven, uh, and just to reiterate, That's okay. Thank you, Gail. Okay, so community driven, everybody, you know, that, that's a given. It's gotta start with the community. They've gotta want us to come to the community. Uh, number two is we attack the cost, uh, which I'll come back to, but we basically get infill donated land. We get very low cost financing. Uh, we, we bring construction expertise. So if you think about home uh, building, 
there's a bunch of companies that build thousands of home ownership units in Denver, mixed in neighborhoods, Oakwood. They know how to be super efficient. Um, we use, in our case, factory built homes, and then finally, which I'll come back to, is homeowner uh, lending assistance. Uh, next slide. So as we try to pare down, this is kind of a weird slide, but as we kind of pare down this idea of, you know, it costs $600,000 in Norwood for a home, if you take out the cost of land, that's maybe $12,000 per house. If you take out uh, the cost of, of financing, you know, essentially construction lending, that's maybe $25,000. Uh, we put in about $50,000 in grant subsidy. It's about 20% of the capital stack. And then we attack the actual cost of building the unit by going to factory built homes. Uh, next slide. So I'm just gonna take you very quickly through uh, the Norwood development. This is a, this is a subdivision. In the foreground is the new uh, Norwood School. This is about, tw uh, this is about a, a town of about 1,000 people. It's a tra very traditional ranching community. It is, not a, it is not Basalt or Carbondale that commutes to Telluride. It is actually a, 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 a community that's you know, got a history in ranching. Um, so this is a 24 unit development or home development. Uh, and the point of showing you this is this is very expensive to do, to build the infrastructure, to put in the deep utilities, the roads, pave them, the streets, the detention pond. That's even before you build a foundation. Next slide. So we use this factory built uh, modular product out of, um, uh, it's called Fading West out of Buena Vista. If there's one thing I can leave you with is if you're driving through Buena Vista, stop at the factory to see the factory and how these are built. The factory built construction has been around for a long time. Uh, we had 10 factories in Colorado in 2008 and we had zero in 2010 because of the downturn. They're completely dependent on the pipeline demand. So you can't have a downturn. But now they're coming back. There's new technology. And this is a semi-automated factory, but there's gonna be a fully automated factory in Grand Junction that's gonna come out of the ground here shortly. But they're basically, you know, framing, building a house inside, and then we have to ship it. Next slide. So this is the finished product. Uh, the house is wrapped. It's a two-story house. That's an individual just walking through the, the yard. On the left is what's coming out of the factory. So this house has the lights in and the fans and the kitchen sink and everything else. We've got to move the appliances in and plug everything together. Um, but that, that's what builds efficiency. If you think about the cost of a framer in a job in Aspen, they're probably getting paid $100 an hour, $75 an hour, a framer in the factory will be getting paid $20 an hour. So you're attacking the fundamentals of this whole process. Next slide. Uh, this is actually shipping. I wanted to show this because this is, uh, we had to take the boxes, our homes, from Buena Vista over Tennessee Pass, over Vail Pass, to Grand Junction, to Gateway, to get to Norwood. Because Interstate 50 between Gunnison and Montrose was such a mess. But it's pretty cool to drive 48 of these semis through rural Colorado, and people are going, are we being invaded? What, what's going on? Next slide. This is the setting and stitching. So you saw the foundations earlier when I was doing the, we're showing the subdivision. This is actually when the boxes come in. We can put all the homes on their foundations uh, 24 homes in four days. So this is, you know, this is attacking the efficiency of building. And um, I'm not sold on Gail's idea of a factory, but it is the, the future of building. We'll get to that later. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, this is just a finished product. It's, this is actually a duplex. On the left is a two bedroom. Uh, two bath house on the right is a three bedroom, three bath. Some of the houses come with garages. All of them have solar, uh, heat pumps. Um, the house on the left, 200, uh, two bedroom, two bath, it was the lowest price house was 225,000. Uh, on the right, uh, that's about a $380,000 house. Three bedroom, three bath. Next slide. So just last two slides. 
We, uh, all of these are deed restricted. They're designed for the local workforce. So again, what we're trying to solve for is that teacher or the deputy sheriff or the first responder. So um, they're all priced at 120% AMI and below. In our initial tranche of, uh, tranche of sales in Norwood, the average AMI was 65%. So we're super proud of that. Uh, working households, so you actually have to work and you have to demonstrate your work. Uh, it's earned income. It's not, you know, managing your, your, your investments. It's owner-occupied. You can't own other residential property. Uh, there's a 3% appreciation cap because if you don't cap these, they're one-time affordability. And it's a 100-year term that resets on, on a resale. And then, obviously, the compliance is both the lottery for the uh, unit and the uh, compliance is run by the housing authority. Last slide. Um, th there are two levers to pull in this. One is attacking the cost of construction. The other is providing lending assistance. So we've heard about the down payment assistance program. Uh, the state has a program where you can get $25,000 for AMIs of 80% below. We really need to address the cost of a mortgage because two years ago at 2.5%, you know, you're for, you're, you could buy a lot more of a house. At 6 and 7%, you can buy a lot less of a house. You've lost 40% of your buying power. So we've got, a down, we've got a lending program in partnership with um, Impact Development Fund and First Southwest Bank. These are CDFIs, and First Southwest is a CDFI bank. And we're able, we were able to secure um, some, a pool of funding at 2.5% interest rate. So that really, and that's at 80% and below AMI. But if you could imagine that 2.5% interest rate, basically increases their buying power by about 40% over walking into, nothing against banks. Uh, <laughs> um, and we have great banking partners, but this is the other lever we have to pull because we can't, you can't build a house for $170,000. You can't really build it for $250,000 without subsidies. So, the mortgage is becoming, is a huge opportunity, and we have to figure out how can we access very patient, very low cost capital to fund these kinds of mortgage programs. So with that, thank you. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you. My, my name is Adam Roy. I'm a principal with Headwaters Housing Partners. Um, I'm a Western Colorado native. I've lived in, worked out of Aspen for over two decades. I've been fortunate to work in the Aspen area on some great community serving projects over the years. In those projects, we've generated over 100 FTEs of workforce housing all within the APSHA, our local housing program. So I felt really proud to be part of that over a number of years of my career. Growing up in Western Colorado, I think I have a particularly unique vantage point to see changes that maybe others don't and shifts in our d demographics, and not just up in the mountain valleys, but all the way down through the R Colorado River Valley and reaching Grand Junction. In a number of years, I kind of took notice at that, and it really got me thinking because things don't necessarily happen fast in Western Colorado. And the continued downward pressure, downstream pressure of the resort community started to affect communities that I used to know of the, the towns you just drive by quickly on the way to the desert. I was born and ra raised in Grand Junction, so I drove that stretch many a time. And you never thought much about it. Um, and the pandemic came and just blew that through the roof. And at that point, I kind of felt I needed to kind of pivot my, the second half of my career and really focus on more of a regional approach to housing and workforce housing specifically. Um, that led me to form Headwaters Housing Partners with my partner, Grady Lincoln. Um, we've been at it for about three years now. We have a number of projects scattered all over Western Colorado. We are a for-profit development firm, and our intention is to bring private sector solutions to the workforce housing crisis across our region. I have to give a shout out that this panel even exists because there are times we are not even invited to the conference or we'll be the only ones sitting there. 
I've been on calls where I've been referred to inadvertently as the dark side. <laughs> that we're coming in, wolf in sheep's clothing, to just take advantage of all the money that's out there. Um, we do have an investment model that we believe is a sound business model. It does have risk adjusted returns to investment, but we still know that we can provide solutions that other members of the Hauser community cannot. Um, one of our key tenants, and you've heard it time and time again today, is forming great relationships and partnerships with the other key members of this space, nonprofits, for other for-profits, government agencies, uh, social impact funds, philanthropic organizations, and we've spent the first three hard years of our time really focused on that piece. These trusted partnerships have truly been mission critical to what we're doing and hope to continue to do. Um, just to give you a quick kind of walkthrough of our, our methodology as a private sector uh, development partner in this space, is we start by asking ourselves three questions, and that is, why are we pursuing this potential project? What should the project ultimately become? And then most importantly, how are we going to get it done? Answering the why, why does this potential project make sense for the community it will be serving? I believe Sherry mentioned it in her, her lunchtime presentation. I've also been spoken to by a mentor who says, if you miss that need, the specific demand of that community, you may miss it by entirely. So we really dig in deep. And this sounds like a pretty common practice, a best practice for any project development. But in the housing space, it's particularly important. I'll get to the reasons why shortly. So we really dig into the community. We really learn what is the demand, what is the need. We think we have an idea of what a project could become or should become, and then we learn so much. And we take that, and the next part becomes a lot easier. What? What does it want to be? This is where we talk about target income levels, rent rates, um, unit sizes, multifamily, ownership. What is it? What is the ultimate outcome or a mix of outcomes? And we really feel that this optimized knowledge is acutely important in the affordable housing space because then we get into the how. The how are we going to get this done? As I mentioned before, we really take a lot of pride in the relationships we've built and the partnerships we've established, and that is the key. Once you know what you're doing and why you're doing it ultimately, you can pick from the myriad programs and partners that are out there to help support the project. We have an investment model that does not work without additional funding, whether it be grant or very favorable loan terms, um, but we rely heavily on these partners. I lightheartedly with my partner call it the matrix. I believe when we see a project finally come to form, you can kind of start grabbing at the different pieces that make sense for this project. They're always different from that project. And then really there's this feedback loop between the why and the how that is different for every project and every location and every community and every nuanced difference that you're trying to accomplish with a specific project. Um, that soup, that, that mess of matrix options is exactly what everyone probably glazed over when Rick, Rick Garcia was going through all the different DOLA programs today. But that is the work that we've done over the last few years to find those pieces and understand them and then go to our key partners, whether it be Margie at Chaffa or Olivia at DOH, and we, we talk about what makes the most sense for this project. So I believe on the slide, not the most sexy slide, but it, it, it works because not all of our projects are that glamorous. The top project is what I'll speak to most and just kind of give you an idea of the breadth of project types that we can accomplish as a private sector developer. The top was referenced earlier at, at the old parachute in. It's a motel conversion. Uh, we bought it last year using a program through Division of Housing. And then we're working now, um, we have our land use entitlements in place. And we went into that project thinking this is 107 hotel, motel rooms. The classic model for a motel conversion is you just do the basic you know, upgrades to make it habitable, livable. You have a lot of studios, 107 keys. We got into that community and we learned there were 12 families with Sorry, I didn't expect this. <laughs> Twelve families with students living out of that motel in the school system. We thought it was a bedroom community housing solution. The school district is a close partner of ours, the town, police and fire, the libraries called us. Parachute has its own housing crisis. It's not just a bedroom community, and it wants to protect its own needs and create projects that it needs. And that was what we heard resoundingly in our land use process. So where we're at with that project is we're now working with Division of Housing on some other funding sources. 
um, other key partners, and we're hoping to be into permit and breaking ground next year. To show the variety of projects we can also accomplish with our approach, the lower left is an acquisition. It's a NOAA, Natural Occurring Affordable Housing Project that we purchased from the Grand Junction Housing Authority. The why of that project was the Housing Authority of Grand Junction does a lot of tax credit projects that need to free up some capital to move on to its next project to put it out to market. We answered by saying, what if we restricted this at a 60% AMI level? We had also asked for a reduced purchase price. The Housing Authority worked with us for over a year and a half. We layered in five other state social impact funding programs with CHAFA, with Division of Housing, and we were able to close that. And at the, after the closing, everybody at the table went out and had a celebratory cocktail afterwards. So it's not your typical buy-sell across the table arrangement. We were partners through the deal and still are today. And lastly and most uniquely, I think, shows the extreme. This is a downtown project that we um, won an RFP with the Downtown Grand Junction Development, uh, downtown Development Authority. It is a nine-story, first-of-its-kind housing, mixed-income mixed housing project at Grand Junction. It'll be north of $30 million. It'll, have, it'll house an artist facility for, for artists, um, the artist community and artist economy in, in Grand Junction. It'll be a mix of income between market rate and at least 50%, 80% AMI and below. It serves a huge need and, and checks a lot of boxes of the community of Grand Junction, not just as a housing solution, but as an economic development tool. So we are in the process there of moving into pre-development phase. We've secured or earmarked uh, millions of dollars of state funding through different programs. And we'll continue down that path. Uh, we're doing a HUD loan underwriting. So once again, we're covering from the local, the state, and the federal all opportunities for supportive funding so we can do and provide and pr produce projects that really cover the gamut of a need of different communities where others may be more limited. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Adam. Mike, go ahead. That's hard to follow. Um, but Mike Sirak, I'm with Real America. Um, and I agree with Adam that we're very fortunate to be a part of this event. Um, thank you, Gail, for putting this on. But, um, it's great to see this many people in one room committed to um, creating and, and preserving more affordable housing. Um, Real America was started in 1995 um, with the sole purpose of developing um, LIHTC rental um, affordable properties. Um, it was started by my mom, Rhonda Shrewsbury, um, and we have three operating companies, Real America Development, Real America Construction, and Real America Management. So we, um, we're the general contractor on all of our projects, um, and then we manage our communities after they're open. Um, you know, we've done pro you know, about 3,000 units in total, um, and really um, it, it's great to go last because what Charlie and Margie said um, kind of sets, um, sets the guidelines for what is really required for what we do. Um, you know, we stay in our lane, we do you know, rental um, affordable housing through the, the LIHTC program, and that really wouldn't be possible if it weren't for Chaffa. Um, and so I appreciate you guys laying that out and explaining it. Don't have to go into too much detail there. Um, but they're obviously very um, competitive tax credits to get. Um, and once, um, um, once you're awarded them, it, it really makes the project come to fruition. And so the first one that we did um, in Western Colorado was Roaring Fork Apartments. It's 56 units in Basalt. Um, we have a mix there. It's a true mixed income community. So um, we have 44 um, LIHTC units which range from 30 to 60 percent AMI and we have 12 market rate units but they actually fall under the town of assaults affordable housing guidelines so they're restricted at um, 120 percent AMI and less um, that project has been uh, very successful we're really proud of it um, I was talking to Catherine Gross Cup, Gross Cup earlier um, about trying to set up an open house to get um, more people through the building we're, we're very proud of it um, it fronts the Roaring Fork River we have a great back patio if the slide's up there, you can see we have a dog wash station, we have ski lockers, we have a, a bike storage. Um, you really wouldn't know it's affordable housing. Um, it's built to the same standard that, um, you know, market rate development would be built to. Um, and um, the last time I talked to our property manager, we have a 300 household wait list to get in there, which I know I don't need to go on and on about the demand for affordable housing in this valley, but um, that just really speaks to it. And so I think there's, that opened up in 2018. I think there's people that just don't want to move out because there's no other options. Um, we're working on two other projects currently too. So I'll jump to 
residences at Dry Cedar Creek is in Montrose. This was recently awarded tax credits um, in May of 2022. We're getting ready to break ground within the next couple of weeks. This is in Montrose, directly adjacent to the uh, Montrose Rec Center. Great location. Um, Chaffa um, has good guidelines to promote uh, public transportation, access to grocery, shopping, um, employment centers, and this, this and Roaring Fork Apartments really check all those boxes. Um, this will be 60 units, 54 of which will be um, um, restricted to 30 to 60% AMI. Then we'll have six market rate units there, so also a mixed income community. Um, it'll have the same amenities, uh, or similar amenities, I guess, to what we have at, at Roaring Fork Apartments. Um, and we're looking forward to, to opening that. Um, and to kind of touch on um, all the different resources that, that we need to make these projects feasible. Um, like DOLA, I'm glad that Rick was able to speak. Um, Residents of Dry Cedar Creek is the first project that we've worked with DOLA on. Um, and we were, um, were very fortunate to receive some gap funding in the way of a low interest rate loan. Um, because really something that's unique is, you know, the cost to build these projects are not any cheaper than a market rate development. And the rents, especially in a place like Montrose County, are, are lower than what we see here. And so there was a, a pretty significant gap there. So DOLA and the Colorado Division of Housing um, gave us a very big resource with that. Um, other resources such as Wave City fees, TAP impact fees, um, building permit fees um, go a long way. And then partnering with the Montrose County Housing Authority, we partnered with APCHA on, um, on um, Roaring Fork Apartments to get property tax um, exemption only helps these projects as well. Um, so we're very thankful for all of our partners that come together. Um, and then even other things um, cities can do to promote density, I know that was talked about earlier. So the last project is Mountain View Flats in, um, in Glenwood Springs. It's currently under construction right now, it's 40 units. Um, worked closely with Hannah Klossman on that. Um, small things such as, you know, we had a slight parking reduction there um, because we're close to two bus stops. We provided more than um, the required amount of parking or bicycle parking spaces. Um, so it's really great to have cities that um, kind of share the vision that we have to promote, um, you know, denser, you know, it's not a big development, but at least for the site, it, it was a little bit um, dense and we're appreciative of, of those partnerships there. Um, and with that project, it is, um, it's market rate, but it does um, fall under the, the recently adopted or, um, Glenwood Springs Community Housing Ordinance. So 20% of those units are restricted to people that work in Glenwood Springs, and then 10% 10, 10 of those units um, are restricted to 100% AMI and lower. Um, and again, with that, we're, we're trying to capture a market that's been touched on today a little bit. It's kind of that missing middle. Um, it's been talked about, you know, the AMIs in places like uh, the Roaring Fork Valley sometimes don't really apply to other locations. And so we're trying to, to fill that gap with people that, you know, can't really necessarily afford to live in a brand new luxury high-end market rate community or, or buy a, a, a home, obviously, but then they make too much money um, where they fall outside of that 60% AMI threshold. And so we think we're capturing this um, in this project. Um, you know, we're not going in and, and doing a, a super high-end amenity package. We're, we're trying to build a product that fits the needs of that community, um, and we're really excited about it. We think, it, we think it'll, be, it'll be very popular. Um, so those are three examples of projects that we're working on out here. But something else I wanted to touch on, um, we are an Indiana-based company, and we've, we've built quite a bit of uh, affordable housing throughout the state of Indiana. Um, we're working with, um, we have three really cool projects where we're partnering with local service providers and we have um, set aside units for people with developmental disabilities. And um, we're really proud of it because we have, we'll build space in the communities where the service providers can have an office, they can meet with their clients, and then they can also be there on site to assist with people with those intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, another one we're doing is we're partnering with the domestic abuse shelter. Um, and survivors of, of domestic abuse. Um, and there's a certain amount of units there set aside for those, that population, which I think is something just in the long term is we would definitely like to replicate in, in places um, in Colorado, in Western Colorado in particular. Um, they've all been really well received. Another one is uh, partnering with a um, um, local community college and, and colleges in the area for a single, a single parent success program 
where we'll provide extra space in a clubhouse where people from, whether it's education majors or people from those communities, colleges can come to, the, to our property, meet with our residents, help them navigate you know, the financial aid system. Um, we do tuition match programs. We provide space where they can come in and, and help um, tutor our residents that are trying to um, better themselves. And so I just wanted to kind of touch on those. That, um, there's a lot of really cool projects that we're working on and we look forward to keep doing more. Mike, thanks for that. Um, so it's obvious to me that uh, all three of you are creating social impact by delivering your unique expertise. Um, Paul, I'll start with you. Uh, help us understand what, um, what the process looks like. Uh, there are so many different pieces to your projects. You mentioned patient capital is in there. Uh, you've got state and federal money, I believe. Walk us through when you um, identify a site or a market that has a need. Where do you go from there? Yeah, somebody said earlier, land is, land is the issue. You've got to get a piece of land. It, it's all, you know, basically a, a theory until you have a piece of land or you have an option to get a land. So you've got to identify land first. You've obviously got to bring the community immediately into it. It doesn't do any good to have the community get charged up if you don't have a project i.e. land. So our thesis was there are 162 rural school districts. They're long on land, short on teachers and kids. And there'd be plenty of land to donate, and we would build housing for school districts. We, they don't have to fund it. We would build it. Their teachers could buy it. We're 0 and 2 with school districts. So I know that's a different with Roaring Fork, and that's a credit to, to this valley. Um, but We've had other, you know, in, our, in Norwood, the land got donated by the county. It was actually an in-holding in the town of Norwood. In Ridgeway, we actually had a donor. I got turned down by the school district, but a donor stepped up and wrote a check for me to be able to buy a piece of land. So somebody also said, communities want these projects to work, and they will step up to the table. But you have to give them a tangible, it's not a concept, it's not another study, it's not another... <laughs> entity, it's give me a project and I will write a check for that. So to your question, it's land, the community. Then we go out, uh, we've got uh, funding from uh, 10 different foundations. So I raised a revolving loan fund of, half, of $5 million that's 50 basis points. So it's essentially free capital that can be used to fund the construction. On every project, we then go to the Department of Housing uh, and they are the they are the greatest partner in this effort, right? Rick Garcia, Allison George, Dola, DOH. They have so much expertise, so much funding. They're fantastic. So we go to them for each project for construction revolving loan fund at very low cost, 50 basis points, and a small grant. And then it's running the trap line with the entitlement, getting the factory order under um, in and then breaking ground. So it starts with the land. Starts with the land. Starts with the land. Um, Adam, uh, so how do you go about selecting a project? Um, you know, we talked about the Roaring Fork Valley in depth. There's need up and down the valley. Uh, you know, what brings your attention to a particular area or a potential project? I, I describe it as the kind of the transect of growth. And gr the transect of growth is f way up in our mountain communities and our valleys all the way down I-70 till you hit Grand Junction. And so we have sort of a different thesis along that way. When you're all the way up, and you actually, Paul hit it nail on the head. When you're up in Aspen and you're in Vail, there's not a lot of state programs that line up very well. LIHTC is hard up in the uh, upper reaches of the valley. The programs, even though they're high AMI, they still don't match up. And then most of these communities have their own programs. And so to get a state program to match up with a local program, it gets tricky. So my feeling is that up, you know, up in our community up here, these are going to be local programs for the most part. There's certainly some outside money that can help it, but we have to create our own destiny for how we create our own housing up here. Now, as you work your way down that growth transect, we sort of identify different communities that also follow an AMI spectrum. So when you hit Glenwood, different today than it was five, seven years ago, 
Newcastle has homes at over a million dollars. Now you keep going down the line, and so we target a different approach and a, a, a different set of um, programs that could line up with those communities first. And then we just go and find any land opportunity, whether it's a off off market acquisition, partnering with a, a you know a, a land a, a landholder or you know. A, school district or this, a town um, that's willing to play a patient game because that upfront money is expensive. The process isn't fast. And so we can, if we can knock down the cost upfront as much as we can to the point where we can access some of this supportive funding, that's kind of our, our, our target with each different location. And as a follow-up to that, um, so uh, there's a patience to it. Um, what kind of timeline are we talking about? Uh, um, we like to say that because we are the private sector, we can come in a little bit faster, but sometimes we are at the mercy of, of bureaucracy. And right now, you know, state programs are flooded. Um, I, I believe it was Rick again that mentioned that their, you know, $180 million program that they thought was going to run for a year was spoken for in two rounds of applications. And so they're inundated with, in a good way, but it also creates a longer process. So. Again, whatever we can do to sort of knock down that front end cost and carry really helps give life to the project down the way. Um, I believe from when we acquired or first started looking at the parachute in as a potential opportunity until we're done, it'll be a four year process. Four years. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, the, the cost comes down, which makes it feasible. Yep, but the, just... the need is now, and so anything we can do to burn down that time is, is critical, mission right. critical. If there's a way to knock that time factor down, that's, that's the most important thing we can do right now. Uh, and then Mike, what about you? Um, what's your sort of project selection criteria? How do you narrow in on a particular opportunity? Sure, so I touched on it earlier. A lot of it is driven by what Chaffa views and what we agree is, is best for the residents that live in our housing. So um, access to public transportation is a big one um, because we realize that, you know, well, a lot of times people you know, may not have a car. Um, and so being able to access public transportation, get to their job centers, it's really important to us. Um, and then other things mentioned, you know, amenity wise, um, grocery stores, um, access to, to healthcare, schools, all very important. Um, and so while Paul's doing great work with in the, the rural areas, um, a lot of what we're looking for in the light tech space is, um, you know, well-located land, which unfortunately, um, means it's more expensive usually too. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's really our biggest hurdle. If, if there was an abundance of land um, in these areas, then we would do, we'd be doing 100 of these projects. Um, it's just, you know, it's really hard to find um, that right piece and especially something that's relatively flat and won't you know, require a ton of uh, earthwork involved. Um, it really kind of is a needle in the haystack, but we've been lucky with the opportunities that we found. Um, Roaring Fork Apartments was actually planned originally to be a hotel, um, and then when the recession hit, um, it, you know, the, the foundation was poured and then it had sat vacant or empty there for, for a little while once that original developer kind of pumped the brakes. So we were fortunate to come into that. Um, we were able to get, come in at a relatively low basis and saved actually some money on um, some of the, the, the site work and foundation that was already spent there. Um, all different, every deal is different, but um, you know, I guess that kind of touches on what we're looking every for. Every deal is very unique. Every deal is different, yep. Yeah, um, and then so to follow up with that, uh, you specialize, one of your specialties is LITAC. And I was talking with uh, Charlie Bantis earlier and he said LITAC is complex. Um, can you help shed some light on what is required to put a project that involves those sorts of tax credits together? So it is very complicated, that's true. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into it with the uncertainty that the project may not even come, come to fruition. And so there's a lot of money that's spent on the front end in putting together an application, um, securing the land. It's not always easy either when, you know, um, a lot of owners of the land don't want to let us have it under contract or tied up for a year or more time to put it in an application to Chaffa. Um, and there's a lot of money just in the way of environmental costs, you know, geotech, um, appraisal, market study, um, everything that goes into our application um, makes it difficult. And then, um, you know, once we get the tax credit award, it's we're thrilled, it's great, but then that's when a lot of the real work starts too. So um, thankfully, the tax credit program has been 
in our opinion, the most effective tool to create um, rental affordable housing. It's what it's been around for a while. Um, and so once we get the the tax credits, there's a there's a good market for investors for it. Um, so we go out to syndicators and, and sell it, um, sell it through them. And then um, once the project's built, there's a very strict compliance process. So we have a whole department dedicated, you know, with three full time staff. That's all about um, you know qualifying our residents, making sure that we stay in compliance with the tax credits. Um, the last thing we want to do is lose our tax credits. <laughs> Right. Okay. So there's a lot of pieces there, um, but the opportunity, nonetheless, is that there's uh, the springs of the cost. The cost of capital goes down significantly enough to enable these projects to move forward, which is the good news. Um, so, uh, if we could go briefly, because I think we're nearing the end of this segment. Um, so, if you guys could just say, like, if you had a uh, your wish, you know. Um, that would really empower these programs, a way they could be improved? How would you put that concisely? And I'll start with you, Mike, sorry. Well, yeah, a couple, two things, I guess. Land would be obviously top of the list, but then second would be, and I think what, one thing that's great about Colorado and Chaffa is willingness to be creative, and everyone else in this room, is willingness to get creative with other um, soft funds or gap financing. Not necessarily, it has to be a 9% tax credit award because um, they are very competitive, um, and I was having another conversation with Catherine Grosko about that today. Um, you know, it, little things that we can do to bridge that gap where Chaffa can use more tax credits or can save tax credits on my deal, which means that they can go allocate more to one or two more projects is only going to create more housing. And so, thanks, Adam. Yeah, I, I mentioned it before it's a kind of a two part answer. Um, first and foremost, you know, invite us to the table. Um, we don't get access to straight grant money through Division of Housing or other state programs. We get low interest loans. Um, they certainly help, especially in today's lending environment, but we're doing the same thing, the same work, sometimes more efficiently, and we kind of cover a different side of the, the puzzle than maybe the nonprofit or the public sector does. Um, so find ways to let us be, you know, we, we certainly have an investment, you know, model behind it. Um, but it does come with some risk adjusted expectations on that investment. Um, and then I'd say secondly is programs that help support this kind of middle piece of a project. Pre-development funding is really hard from the private sector. A, a nonprofit can build that into their, you know, their kind of financial stream throughout a, the course of a year. This is investment money that we have to then put to work when we don't really know what the outcome at the back end is going to be. So if there's programmatic money that can support the pre-development phase of getting a project from maybe acquisition and entitlement, but then all the way through architecture, engineering, and ultimately you know, breaking ground. We've got great construction loan products, but to get from acquisition to that point can be very so difficult. So financial sometimes. assistance on the pre-development phase. And bridge, we, we pursue bridge loans. Um, I think IDF has been mentioned. That's, these are models that we have to pursue that aren't necessarily any cheaper, but they are the only opportunity we have without putting private equity and capital work at that point in the process. Thanks. Paul. The, the, what I would add is the construction business is completely disaggregated. And because of that, it's incredibly inefficient. We're building houses the way we did, what, 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. We haven't changed that. We've got to integrate the systems together. And I think j just whether it's having a template for entitlements, I mean, that's, it's not the land use code that's the problem. It's that there's a template to get this approved. I want to build 24 homes in a rural community. You know, let me run the trap line, takes three months, then I can get the project built in a year. But, you know, now it's just this completely disaggregated uh, industry where you've got architecture and engineering and manufacturing. No other industry works like that. We are untouched by mankind. So we've got to reintegrate all of this together to get the efficiencies because we can't sustain the cost of construction. It is out of control, and we can't put that genie back in the bottle. So we need to bring uh, the whole sort of uh, construction piece, consolidate it. Yep. Thank you. All right, panel, thank you very much. <laughs>